after so much drama, it is always a good time to bring up the spooky... Oh... Halloween was already... Ha. Huh. There is however no law prohibiting reviewing the PS2 game Castlevania Lament of Innocence after New Year's Day. As far as I know. In a world full of sparse Castlevania re-releases and NFTs of all cursed things, something like a PS2 3D Castlevania game seems weirdly unbelievable. But how did we get to that point? <laughs> At the start of the PS2 generation, the Castlevania franchise was in a really odd place. The first 3D Castlevania on the N64 was met with an in hindsight surprisingly mixed reception. Its direct semi-expansion, sequel, prequel could however only make a small splash and quickly sank in the sea that was 1999. So much happened in that year, even I was born there. Two years earlier, the critically acclaimed Symphony of the Night initially only sold sluggishly before it developed in the years to come into a PS1 classic. Maybe that was a sign of this era's changing attitude towards everything 2D. In light of more and more powerful console hardware, a noticeable part of the gaming mainstream, declared in a polygonal, drunken state, pixel art as inherently outdated. Effectively closing the two-dimensional door for most mainstream franchises on consoles. So, Konami decided to try another 3D parachute jump, in hopes of now sticking the landing. But to materialize this, more incubation time was needed. Or maybe they were just too busy with starting and cancelling development on Castlevania Resurrection for the Dreamcast. Maybe it was part of a master plan all along or something. I am not Konami management. Thank the universe. No judgment. In the meantime, the Castlevania series was moving along nicely with 2D handheld titles. But then the year 2003 started with the January issue of the unofficial, totally unbiased and unrivaled PlayStation 2 magazine PSM. Not to be confused with the totally biased and rivaled official UK PlayStation 2 magazine that was apparently published by the same company as PSM, or the official US PlayStation magazine, or the Photographic Society of Metras in the Indian city Sene, formerly known as Metras. But back to this fateful 2003 PSM issue, in which Castlevania Symphony of the Night producer Koji Igarashi hinted at another 3D Castlevania release, but remained mostly tight-lipped. Then, four issues later, in May 2003, PSM finally broke the news that a new 3D Castlevania for the PS2 will see its announcement during that year's E3. And the PSM prophecy came true! The announcement trailer not only revealed the game's name as Castlevania Lament of Innocence, but also the first snippets from its action gameplay. Just to visualize the action landscape this game was announced in, the hotly awaited Devil May Cry 2 released in January to, in hindsight, also surprisingly mixed reviews, and Onimusha 3 was scheduled for the still far away space future of 2004 several months after Lament of Innocence targeted release date. If there ever was a Goldilocks time in PS2 action gaming, then that was probably it. Meanwhile, the previews for Lament of Innocence started to come in and were promising. And while Koji Garashi did admit that 3D was more difficult to design for than 2D, otherwise nothing looked worrisome. Reportedly, they even had the development team four times the size of Symphony of the Nights and enough development time left to tweak the difficulty of the game. Igarashi continued to give interviews while the marketing machine had roared to life, producing magazine ads, promotional calendars, promotional booklets, digital wallpapers and TV ads, including one where the idol and actress Sonim, not to be confused with a manufacturer of work phones that probably can break your bones, is semi-accurately cosplaying as the main protagonist for some publicity reasons, I guess? Small fun fact. 
Sonam is also a rather prolific theatre and musical actress who, according to her Japanese Wikipedia page, had roles in Japanese stage productions of, among others, Kinky Boots, Rent, The Rocky Horror Show, Rivering Heights, Henry VI, Dance of the Vampires, and a 2021 musical adaptation of the 2009 Zac Efron vehicle, Seventeen Again. That I did not make up. I swear! It actually kinda looks like fun to be honest. Cool for her! But back to the game. For better or for worse, if something was common in early 2000s video game advertising, Lament of Innocence marketing team has done it. So everything seemed to have moved in place for success. Eventually October of 2003, or November 2003, or February 2004, if you happen to exist in Japan, Europe, or Australia, rolled around. Lament of Innocence release day had arrived, just as the game arrived with a manual that includes a sentence that aged in my opinion like a potato salad and an egg sandwich holding hands and flying straight into the sun together. But it's still the sadly in hindsight thematically familiar year of 2003. But at least Konami does not smell burnt yet. I guess. So what could be the reason this game just slips out of at least my memory every few minutes? First, let's take a look at the game itself. And here a short disclaimer. I played Lament of Innocence on an emulator because my laziness is the one constant in my thought process. But there's also another reason I will get to later. Also, this video will continue the usage of blurry PS4 footage that basically is now a trademark of this channel, I guess. Because I of course bought the one capture device thingy that lets you directly record onto an SD card, which is really convenient for me, but sadly it only works with the Nintendo Switch. For some tech science reason. But at least the dusty recording feature of my trusty PS4 may hurt your eyes, dear viewers, that may exist, but it never fails me. Never. That is also the reason why I now own two copies of the Dell May Cry HD collection. Yes, even on sale, the Switch versions of the PS2 DMC games cost together more than I paid for this PS4 version. And I'm still struck with the curse of probably mispronouncing everything ever, including all the names up to this point. I try and I'm already sorry. But with no further ado... <laughs> <laughs> Set in 1094, the year where according to number one historical source, Wikipedia, not much happens apparently, Castlevania Lament of Innocence is as of time of writing, and probably for the near future, the chronologically first game in the main series timeline. Sorry Castlevania legends, but the 3D Castlevanias needed a fresh start. And they were starting to run out of space on the story timeline to put another Castlevania game in, with Dracula arriving only every hundred years or so. But that gives us a unique opportunity to witness the heroic beginnings of Castlevania's sentence to hunt one immortal dude forever, resident vampire killers, the Belmont family. After starting a new game, a narrated story crawl in that font introduces us to the setup and some character key art. Reduce, reuse, recycle. Nice. By the way, these magnificent illustrations are of course done by Castlevania Mainstay and potential victim of mistaken identity at every probably sad international Konami work party, Ayami Kojima. Her skillful drawings also adorn the game's American and Japanese covers. But the European one wanted to be honest, because here we have the polygonal knight, Leon Belmont, who had a really bad start of the year 1094. His fiancée, a demure cutie named Sarah. Thanks, Electronic Gaming Monthly, for that clarification, died. 
followed by his alchemist's best friend for some biblical reason named Matthias, who reveals as his dying words something in the lines of Dude, your fiancé was just kidnapped and is now waiting in that big vampire castle over there. Almost forgot to tell you. Sorry. Oh, dead. That is not a good sign. Classic rogue justice seeker style, Knight Leon leaves his night company and title behind to investigate. At least having some luck that day. On his way to the castle, now just Leon runs into the maybe most helpful stranger ever, named Rinaldo Gandolfi, a crusty alchemist. Thanks again, Electronic Gaming Monthly, who turns out to be a friend of the late Matthias, Leon has never heard of. That is not a good sign. Again. But Rinaldo, still most helpful stranger ever, invites Leon to his cottage slash item shop and gifts him his retired whip because family traditions have to start somewhere. And acquisition of regular vampire hunting customers is important for local businesses. As another freebie, he also discloses to Leon that in order to save his fiance, he needs to kill five boss creatures to get their seals, with which he can advance to the real baddie, Walter whose effectiveness as a villain is undermined by him just being a mansion for the majority of the game. Even his misdeeds are just always talked about and never shown, which weakens for me at least his big entrance in the finale. Uh, some spoilers from now on. But let's be honest, probably most lifeforms don't play Castlevania for the story. No judgment. To quote Koji Garashi, what I care about is bringing in just enough story not to overwhelm or spoil the action. However, in my experience, Lament of Innocence does have a handful of smaller highlight moments. But for the most part, it takes itself so serious that for me, it never really reaches entertaining levels of she's. In my untrained ears, the dialogue is for the most part serviceable, but our protagonist Leon has, in my opinion, just as much charisma as his 1998 parallel universe first name sibling. But Resident Evil 2's Leon is supposed to be a normal boring human, stuck in a burning zombie town with a hangover, three bullets and a dream. The Leon of Lament of Innocence rips ghost knights and does double jumps before stuffing shortcake in his face. More on that word combination later. Okay, I'm a bit exaggerating. Leon Belmont is a different character compared to Leon S. Kennedy. Just listen to him. The force of your grief can only make me stronger. Because this was totally about you, Leon. Thanks! Hashtag likable protagonist material. <clears throat> Maybe the rest of the story could iron out the creases for me? In that regard, with Lament of Innocence old school video game setup, sadly also come the, in my opinion, typical downsides. Uh, spoilers for all your early 2000s media observations. For example, Leon's love interest Sarah, of course, has to willingly sacrifice herself, because this unhelpful fictional person will probably not be motivated by the greater good of fictional humanity. Hashtag likable protagonist material. <coughs> At least in my point of view, it is a positive surprise that the story presents her as having a choice, and thereby some agency over the situation, instead of just being randomly dunked into a vampire dingo enclosure and killed off without even having a single line of dialogue. But let's be honest, this fictional situation someone wrote her in is probably not material for your next empowering fictional moments to look back to montage. Looking at a different scene near the end, there is also a surprisingly interesting comparison between two characters, which adds a little extra thematic complexity. Just to be followed up by the game throwing in a seemingly random new character name and no one in the English dubbing booth apparently could decide on its pronunciation. I can relate. Maybe this is the unknown precursor to Balan Wonderworld and everything is explained in a secondary novel. 
Or maybe this is just a symptom of my deepest experience with Castlevania lore being not having yet watched the final season of the Netflix show? But now that we threw out all pretenses of not spoiling anyone this game, how does it actually end? Leon, I give it to you, buddy! We have to go. We don't have any time to waste. Go? Where? Hey, it's up to us to take out Umbrella. Yes, it's just a sequel setup. Even if occasionally a few moments have surprised me positively, overall I wish they would have either done more with the scenario or just slimmed it down to the serviceable minimum to be honest. It's not fish, nor meat, nor veggies. It's sadly for my taste just half-baked. But moving on to the part you, the viewer that may exist, probably paused your contemplation about the current, past and future state of the world and all your Elden Ring play session for. <laughs> In this section, I will now try to look at the game through several different lenses. First, and in my view the most obvious one, Castlevania as an action game that was probably somewhat inspired by the original Devil May Cry. Koji Igarashi does mention the first Devil May Cry in this GameStop interview with regards to its graphical achievements and the popularity of this type of game on the PlayStation 2. And yeah, this influence can be seen in the final product, because Lament of Innocence is also an action game with combos, but no style ratings, because no one wants to be associated with the label CLONE. A scary shadow waiting to of course not drag you into a fictional office and force you to make video game reviews till the sun eats us all. <coughs> Lament of Innocence adds to the DMC1 foundation a whip with an attack for crowd control and one for singular targets. This gets expanded by new combos that Leon learns when encountering new enemy types, but the combo list is overall rather short. It does not help that there aren't any combos using pauses or holding down buttons as far as my brain can tell. But moving on. Ronaldo, as always nicest stranger ever, also bestowed to Leon a strange magic that attaches to his arm. Before it gets to your by reality already stressed nerves. No, you didn't accidentally mix up game discs. This here is not Onimusha. Leon does not have to manually suck in souls, instead he gains MP only via blocking with R1 and R2 in the face of glowing attacks. The MP bar is used up when activating one of several relics, which are comparable to DMC2's modifiable devil trigger. More on that later. However, in Lament of Innocence, you have to access this relic state via a button combination while blocking for some reason? During blocking you can also dodge and… uh, hold on! You block with R1 and R2 and you don't have a specific button for Leon's version of a devil trigger? Is the locker on the same button as blocking or… <laughs> Besides one exception, more on that later, Castlevania Lament of Innocence has no lock on. Unless I just have missed this feature in my 8 hour playthrough of this game… somehow? Which could just be the case with the in my opinion too minimal and fast paced tutorial screens? But I did check all the buttons I could think of and got nothing, so… At least, it looks like the game was semi-designed without a lock-on in mind, because the block ignores the direction of the enemy's attacks. It could just be my personal video game reviewer, video game incompetence, but this mechanic felt for me at least, at times a bit inconsistent. Why can I block this one attack, but not the one after that? Why can I block 4 projectiles but not a 5th? Combos that in other games would have used the lock on are also now just longer button combinations, but sometimes Leon's animations are a bit languid and he does not get this far into the combo and I don't know if I am the problem or Leon. But can you control the camera? 
Good question, viewer, that may exist. While DMC1, due to its Resident Evil DNA, was mostly made up of a string of static camera angles, the Met of Innocence camera just automatically follows you around. Or to quote the Electronic Gaming Monthly article again, Koji Igarashi made the decision to eschew the admittedly cool looking cinematic camera style of Capcom's Cell McCry PS2 in favor of a fixed overhead camera that swoops and pans only in areas with no combat. The end result is a perspective similar to that of the novel PS2 adventure Eco. You never be surprised by a confusing angle shift while you're in the think of skeleton whipping action. I know games change during development, but does this look like no combat to you? If you are as unlucky as me, some enemies will end up beating you in hide and seek or your camera ends up stranding somewhere? In combination with the missing lock-on, this turned for me faster and flying enemies into a shore, with fitting of detention. To add that little bit of extra garlic to the wound, the down triangle beowulf type attack you have for some reason from the start will also miss most of the times. And if this medusa head hits me again with a stupid roll attack, yes those flying medusa heads had a big sibling and yes I killed it and I laughed. No medusa, I want to be your friend! But for what is the left stick used then? Thanks again for asking, theoretical viewer, who is actually just me writing the script. It opens up a quick menu where you can consume items and change your equipment, more on that later, without pausing. This is in my opinion an interesting gameplay idea for this type of action game, even if it can be a bit difficult to effectively use in the heat of battle. But wait, what about L1 and L2 now? Oh thanks again, me. I'm always so helpful. Leon, take a page from my book. Huh. Here we have another point of similarity to DMC2. These buttons open up wheels to switch between different relics and orbs that vary the behavior of your secondary weapon. By the way, the orbs apparently had their debut in Castlevania Harmony of Dissonance on a GBA. The more you know. Yes, here come Castlevania's famous axes, knives and holy crosses into play. And double yes, they still consume hearts, which Leon can reliably harvest from convenient stone columns littering this castle. In my opinion, the orbs in combination with the wheel menu made those secondary weapons one of the strongest gameplay aspects of Lament of Innocence. With more finesse than me and enough hard resources, you can link several types of attacks together for an interesting attack storm. However, sadly here does the DMC action game design and the Castlevania legacy clash, because just as in the 2D Castlevania games, you can only carry one secondary weapon at a time, which again limits your possibilities. Just one more tool to switch to could have potentially expanded the possibilities of the action gameplay into unknown dimensions. Maybe only combo YouTubers connected in a hive mind could comprehend. But then near the end, the game throws that one boss at you who just swats away secondary weapon attacks like their spam mates, again narrowing the combat options. I can however also see why the developers decided on that with regards to this important fight. You can cake rock your way through some bosses if you get the orb from the stand Medusa head plus some hard container expansions early enough and have as little dignity as me. But I had to compensate my rocking around time somewhere and this golem boss was it, okay? Because yes, I got lost. A lot. Which slightly uncomfortably brings us to the topic of Lament of Innocence as a 3D continuation of Symphony of the Night especially in terms of its RPG elements and exploration. First of all, looking at Castlevania's past 3D experiments, it does make sense in my opinion to adapt the emerging character action genre that DMC1 represents. It contains to some degree all elements familiar to a Symphony of the Night player, like fighting and finding things that open up passages somewhere in this castle. It's basically a less open metroidvania, which does come in handy with expensive 3D graphics. And these graphics had to be expensive, because while trying to emulate Symphony of the Night with its vast areas to explore, they took the minimalist project management route of reusing some hallways. A lot.
During this pandemic, I've spent more time with these angel statues than some people with their relatives. But let's zoom out. There are five areas that make up the vast majority of the game, all of them ending with a boss fight. You can enter any of the sections from the start, but they do differ in difficulty and even design philosophy to the point that it would not surprise me if different people were allocated to work completely independently from each other on different areas. So you have areas like the House of Sacred Remains, that with its repetition and needlessly split paths only containing 4 me lackluster rewards, slowly but steadily pulverized my spirit into sad particles. Does this look fun to explore? Not for me at least. <coughs> but then we also have, in my opinion, nice areas like the Anti-Soul Mystery Slab. Yes, that's its actual name. Not much repetition, good rewards and small single rooms on the side, besides one platformer section not absurdly long. Safe area placement is mostly kind, if we exclude the one from the theater area that is right above the area boss room, so you can't easily return to it after beating those two giant bouncers, maybe to add some challenge or to encourage weirdos like me to break track. Some areas heavily use Leon's new rip for platforming. Before you get your hopes up, it's more like a third little jump than really a usable rip to swing around with, which is a shame in my book. But at least it is consistently inconsistent with its timing. My tip is to just be above the rod you want to rip off of in the exact right angle and then it maybe works. And now do it timed. Other areas have more optional riddles or those more or less not optional gimmick rooms where for example the floor is demon vampire lava. I really like those laser rooms because they made even me feel really smart, which could be a positive or a negative depending on your view of humanity. To conquer all that, Leon has a double jump and at least in my playthrough, it turns out to be on the more wonky side, leading to you often just sliding past the desired landing point. The automatic camera also doesn't help. This section, for example, is introduced with a short cutscene, but how am I supposed to get there without a controllable camera? I can just adjust and find out what is up with this platform? And this is time too! But back to the monster infested grounds, but is the exploration itself. While the developers did try to elevate some confusion, with optional markers you can set on your map and arrows that show through which door you entered, due to the automatic camera, I still often missed hints for environmental riddles or lost grasp on where I was exactly in these big semi same rooms. I know, this could just be the result of my brain being my brain and I sure got used to it, somewhat. But in my opinion, they should have cut down on space or at least maybe added a mini-map. But even if I don't get lost, it became clear for me why the classic exploration heavy metroidvania is usually kept in 2D. With a camera constantly moving and adjusting behind Leon, it felt for me extremely long-winded to just cross one of those big rooms in 3D. While the same action in 2D can often look and feel smooth like a breeze, even if it takes the same amount of time. But let's awkwardly wander on. After completing an area, you receive a new orb and you get sent back to Ronaldo's Vampire Hunter Superstore where you can buy a new armor set to upgrade your defense. Which brings us to another perspective. If you look at Lament of Innocence as an RPG, you probably would not like it. You, your abilities and your equipment don't have an experience bar. If stats outside of you changing equipment increase, then nobody has informed me about it. Every attack fills the screen with numbers, but the enemy health bars that are there don't use exact numbers. Also, I did not find many accessories and the ones I got were mostly random resistance increases that don't feel like much. In my experience, some stats don't even have an obvious purpose in game. Or can you explain what intelligence does? And why do calming earrings increase it? 
And what does the breathing thingy in my body do? Hey, are you okay? Ah, sorry, sorry. My brain had to reboot. Uh, uh, where was where were we? Most of the loot I came into contact with was not that impressive. And I don't know if it was my equally bad luck stats in real life, but for the first half of the game, enemies almost never dropped things. Maybe it only occurs with certain enemy types or combo lengths, but I don't know. And some dropped items like those gems seem to be useless, until I scrolled through a guide and found out that you can find an optional gem crushing accessory in that garden area, making the gems additional expandable special attacks. And yes, I missed this accessory too. Another optional thing my investigative skill also missed most of the time. Most relics. You start out with this fire one that makes Leon stomp fire trails into the ground that harm his enemies. It's also visible in the RPG damage numbers because there's an, in my experience, mostly ignorable element system. In fire relic mode, for example, you are resistant towards fire attacks. Makes sense. There are also enemies that have a weakness towards certain elemental whips. Those are another optional thing that you can unlock through beating hidden bosses. They don't change up your moveset. Due to that, I see them as another missed opportunity to shake up the gameplay. With regards to Lament of Innocence, the Belmont's family reliance on whips as the be-all and end-all got a bit stale for me. Overall, while I can see a huge amount of optional gameplay things as a plus for RPGs and Metroidvanias, in the most unlucky playthroughs, it can leave the non-optional parts of the action gameplay a bit barren. Unless you regularly give your click offerings to the internet game guides of this world. And this is in my opinion a shame, because I personally had the most fun with Lament of Innocence as a character action game. Especially when the instinct of I almost got this boss ah! kicks in. And now, clumsily returning to the first perspective, it's not like the original PS2 DMC1 had not its own issues with first installment clunkiness. You had shooting on both square and circle for some reason, and you couldn't even shoot outside of lock-on, unless you jumped, I guess. And the lock-on wasn't even really visible in the interface. These times were weird. Even if it does feel like the camera thankfully moves less during combat, for me, the occasional hard cuts are a bit annoying. And this font! And this crusty audio file! And sorry, this is just a pixelated yard, not a middle-aged man. Time to get your eyes checked. But even with all these smaller things, you could never say that DMC1 did not have character in the most literal sense. Dante has many thoughts about many things, you can read at almost any corner. Every gun has its own changing animation and even some of the menus. In almost every cutscene Dante looks like an active participant. If my memory does not fail me, also almost every room is unique. With that in mind, for long stretches it felt for me like the developers of Lament of Innocence tried to implant some things from the May Cry, but did not wait for the organs to not get rejected. I really don't want to call it rushed, but it feels for me rushed. Like they wanted to make a Devil May Cry, but they neither had the time, nor looking at Castlevania as an already established franchise, the complete creative freedom to make it its own entertaining thing in terms of character, action and gameplay. My overall evaluation. Lament of Innocence does have some interesting things gameplay wise, but in my opinion it does not work as well as a good character action game, or metroidvania, or RPG, or as we Germans say, it's nothing half and nothing whole. But now has come the time to step on the blood sucking path of nitpicks!
<lacht> While the combat movement does look cool, for me in the cutscenes, the early wonkiness of motion capture in addition to odd cutting, framing and pacing is noticeable. Also, Leon's face kinda looks weird to me in terms of proportions, especially compared with Ayami Kojima's art. And this is probably not the console's fault, because in my opinion, you can say a lot about Devil May Cry 2, but not that this Dante's face looks odd. Okay, this could just be my vaguely demon hunter shaped biases, but these are my nitpicks! Besides a few taunts from bosses like nice this stupid Medusa head. You. I'm so sorry, Medusa. Almost every game over is wrapped into your wounds by your Beyonce screaming. Leon, Leon! Which reawakened long dormant memories. Did they have a crystal ball? Or was this industrial espionage? Or even just Resident Evil coincidence? Enemies that are not killable, or that you can only harm when their protection field is down, are always that bit salt too much in my soup. Sorry. And what indicates that those statues are breakable when those wood crates aren't? How am I supposed to know that game? Other nitpicks include the for me confusing usage of triangle for leaving menus. The seemingly big bad guy, the evil of this world, and hater of all good, being named... Walter. Walter. Me and Castlevania's trademarks are also not always compatible. My easily confused brain is always a bit bothered when hearts aren't a health, but an attack currency. Also, for me, the classic Castlevania modern wall food or now enemy food, looks excessively out of place in a somewhat realistically leaning 3D setting. Did you know? Vampire hunters apparently cut down shortcake and sushi in 1094 Europe. Sorry, that's not a mana prism. It, it's a pill, Leon. Also, don't look at menu Leon too closely. Or this character design that could have sprang out of a random 2003 lingerie catalog. My immersion! It's an amount of innocent shortcake of character designs! <coughs> but of course, we also have to stick our fake vampire teeth in the juicy and so so sweet neck of positive nitpicks. <laughs> <laughs> I kinda appreciate how surprisingly logically consistent some of the cutscenes are. Leon has no sword because he, as a former knight, had to leave his equipment with the knight company. After having to put up his hands to receive his MP absorbing love coating, Leon also has to be reminded to put them back down again. In my view, this gives the digital world a sense of being kept together by an internal logic. Even weighed down by the odd early PS2 face hair proportions and mouth flapping, I can't not like most non-immersion breaking character designs. I just can't say no to long codes in action games, I'm sorry. As is franchise tradition, this Castlevania game also has a good soundtrack, even if not all tracks were to my taste, especially the one from the stupid Medusa fight that does not let me go! Ah! And her placement feels a bit arbitrary at times. Lament of Innocence being a soft restart for the series, Symphony of the Night composer Mishiru Yamane could take some creative liberties leading to this one track you're hearing right now that fits on a really specific vampire themed club dance floor. And it's glorious! I appreciate details such as this lens flare produced by this magical safe bubble or your footsteps sound changing when trampling pristine vampire grass. It's also always nice when enemies can damage each other. While I did not find a lot of accessories in my playthrough, I did stumble upon the fantastic P.O.P. shoes. And who needs a revive after death when your shoes can make those noises? And yes, I beat the game like this. The fact that throughout my playthrough, my shadow self stuck with the holy water as a secondary weapon 
By the way, yes, there are of course two shadow fights. And the second one is the maybe best showcase for the potential secondary weapon combo chains only an AI not bothered by human incompetence can pull off. Apparently some of the areas are based on ones from past Castlevania games and historical accuracy at last! Thanks Koji Garashi, now let me finish my 1090s cuisine! No judgement! This sound engineer that got credited as Great Star Matsufuji. Joachim Armstar is actually a surprisingly entertaining baddie, despite only having a few minutes of screen time during the main story. And that is not only due to his name being the most fun thing set in this game in my opinion. After finishing the first playthrough, you can add him on your dystopian social media of choice to play what feels like simplified versions of the areas Leon already worked through. Later? Maybe this takes place before Leon beats him? I don't know. Maybe he is really relevant to the rest of the franchise. Sorry Joachim. But Walter was at least nice enough to let him have a spectral stepping stool for that jumping tower. Sadly, there are not many other accommodations for him. There's not much to find. You can still earn orbs, but you can't use them. There isn't a story, not even cutscenes. He got virgin before being virgin was even a thing. Just with even less. Incidentally, Joachim even has some virgin elements in his gameplay, because yes, he shoots swords. While doing so, he can change between a crowd control and a more single enemy focused sword stance. Additionally, he can charge his attacks, but he can't change equipment or parry. But he has an MP gauge. For what is that then? Thanks again, me. It unleashes super special magic attacks that look cool, but are actually not that practical with that close camera angle. And talking about the camera, he actually has a lock on, so a sword sits more than air. But the camera does not care. Oh yeah, fair. Overall, for me, that game mode was fun for a few minutes. Especially with how fast Joachim floats around, but I stopped after he was crushed by self-hatred. And do you want to know how hovering vampire people double jump? Here you go. If you beat Joachim's mode, you would get a cool pumpkin mode, but it just wasn't supposed to be. But moving to a different topic, even on an emulator trapped inside a slow laptop, Lament of Innocence ran almost consistently with 60 frames per second. Maybe it occasionally dropped to 59 FPS, but if you see the need to complain about that, you are even nitpickier than me. Another point, only semi related to the game itself, but I always cherish it when people writing internet guides at their own comment. God damn it, early 2000s! I know, it was the Raiden rejection era. Hopefully, the mainstream gaming audience and society as a whole stopped being weird about everything and everybody considered feminine since then. Hmm. As a side note, in my opinion, almost every fairy type Pokemon is more entertaining than Leon. For example, look at this Jigglypuff, that according to the second most trusted historical source, the Pokemon anime, can sing you to sleep, so it can draw mean doodles on your defenses face. Then it probably runs off with your shopping bag and uses your debit card to buy Pokemon sweets and more permanent markers, then rinse and repeat. The Pokemon police will never catch this mastermind. Hashtag most metal Pokemon. Even more unrelated to Lament of Innocence, for this video, I replayed the first mission of DMC2 for the first time in years. And we can of course argue about DMC2's verticality and quality and demon helicopters all day. But can we like get the wall running back? This has the right to be this cool in my opinion. And I know DMC3 also had wall running with the trickster style, but we have to honor the dancer that started it somewhere. Now, however, we should put a spotlight on the aftermath of Lamette of Innocence.
contrary to my first instinct, looking at its seemingly forgotten status nowadays, Castlevania Lament of Innocence did actually get good to great reviews, to the point IGN gave it a 9 out of 10. That is confidence! Minus 10%, but still 90% confidence! This reviewer at GameStop even gave the game a full score! Below that, we have a lot of people who could see the potential for future growth twinkling throughout the game. Even further down, we can however also find a small amount of more middling reviews. Most mirror to some degree my issues, lack the too tedious and repetitive nature of the game. By the way, did you know that the Playboy magazine apparently did some video game reviews in the late 90s and early 2000s? They gave Lament of Innocence a 63, one point away of making an accidental callback. Did they remove a point to avoid giving people who just wanted to have some video game reviews to accompany their naked people pictures flashbacks of Castlevania 64? Uh... Moving on. You can also extract from the reviews which reviewer looked at the game through a character action lens. One even dished out the Fiat Del May Cry clone label. No one wants to be a clone. Uh, of course I can't talk from experience. These echoes also rippled through the Castlevania side of things. Our magazine companions at Electronic Gaming Monthly, for example, actually ended up giving the game a surprisingly cold 76 points, because quote, it never felt like a good Castlevania game, just a good action game. Going even further, in the first episode of the Scottish game review show fittingly named Castlevania, the reviewer, who remember, named their gaming show Castlevania of all things, and so is probably a big Castlevania fan, actively complained about the game having, quote, bullshit combos. Even if they don't see a connection to Del May Cry specifically. But in this video review, you can witness a certain other pattern. A lot of reviewers warmed up to the game the further they played. And you realise how much fun you're having, just opening up that map, just turning those rooms blue, just like back in the old days. See, Castlevania is a grower. It's a shock to the system to a certain extent, because it all seems so different, and then it all seems so familiar. And it's when it gets familiar that you start to fall in love all over again. So, the majority of reviewers liked it for the most part. One point to cross off the list of potential causes for Lament of Innocence irrelevant. What about the players? On the user review side, we can find even better scores. But here, I also tripped over some small surprises. Someone in the non-apocalyptic year of the in terms of movie critics unlucky Zac Efron war movie, the lucky one, 2012, even declared Lament of Innocence to be their favorite game. Now that I think about it, statistically speaking, isn't maybe almost every game at least one person's all-time favorite? Or maybe in their top 5 or something? On this doomed bowling ball, there are a lot of individuals, and having a different opinion and taste is normal. Uh, yeah? To really statistically evaluate if these user opinions are representative for all players, I theoretically would need to know how many units are in circulation, how popular the game is, so to say. So what numbers do we have for Lament of Innocence? In short, I don't know. Oftentimes, for example, a fan wiki has at least a vague idea if something sold like a digital crusty sliced bread or was left lying like a cursed stone. But not for Lament of Innocence? Maybe it was right in front of my weird face and I just missed it, but... The closest info I have is the 2004 Konami annual report that came out the same year as the Lifetime television movie Miracle Run, for which someone had for some reason cast probably neurotypical actor Zac Efron as an autistic child, who of course has the storyline you are probably thinking of right now. And you guessed it. The Konami report didn't even mention Lament of Innocence, because it wasn't World Soccer winning 
wer Friends Corbin Pro Evolution Soccer Free and wer Best Friends Just Pass. Oh, Scientist. Oh, Power Furu Puru Yakyu. I'm so sorry for that pronunciation. Featuring Bomberman's really specific sports cousins. Maybe you could interpret Steady Sales of Secrets to Popular Game Series to include Lament of Innocence, but really clear is something else. Now to come to a confusing point and the second reason why I played this game on an emulator. In Europe at least, the game seems to mostly have kept or even increased its resale price. Why? Maybe it sold well here, but now everyone including your tax accountant wants to play it? Perhaps it sold not that well here and only a select few European vampire enthusiasts want to play it? My personal suspicion is that it sold okay, but the franchise name inflates the interest for certain otherwise not absurdly interested people. While the 10 out of 10 fans will be happy to have a physical copy of her favorite game. Maybe more people buy it to complete their Castlevania collections. Or someone collected like 63.4% of all European copies in circulation to build a shrine for the PAL version of Lament of Innocence, but then their house caught fire due to a mishap in the silly lighter museum next door? We will never know! American copies are according to PriceCharting.com cheaper. Maybe there's less demand for a physical copy, due to Lament of Innocence apparently being available in the American PS3 store that hopefully will not get shut down like some other console store. Nintendo. And Sony, don't think about it. What in my opinion Nintendo and Sony should think about instead. But I can say for sure. Overall, the game had to be financially viable enough to get a semi-sequel with Castlevania Curse of Darkness in the year before High School Musical 2005, even if it actually takes place in 1479 and therefore after Castlevania 3. It apparently did address some of my exploration and camera issues, but got worse reviews than its predecessors somehow. My personal guess is that maybe the critics' opinion on Lament of Innocence graphics and its gameplay style have soured in the meantime, affecting the excitement for more games like that in the year of the very real Zac Efron movie, The Dolby Stallion. But I would not bet this exact rubber ducky on it, because I couldn't find sales data for that game either. The lukewarm critics' scores probably were worse promotion than that calendar. No judgment. Maybe even Sonam couldn't have saved it if I had hired her again. But let's now close the sequel box, because I want to return to the legacy of its predecessor. Lament of Innocence reception wasn't it. Necessarily. And the fact that popularity can't be really determined, but some signs point to acceptable numbers. I kinda ran out of ideas. Metacritic help me! What do we have here? Someone in the year 2 of the current pandemic and probably the filming of season 2 for Down to Earth with Zac Efron 2021 wrote that Lament of Innocence is better than the newer Castlevania Lords of Shadow. And I think there we might have the first reason why the gaming public seems to be less aware of the game. Castlevania Lords of Shadow is just currently slotted in the one brain slot for 3D Castlevania most people seem to have, just due to the simple fact that it is a newer game. And if Lament of Innocence wants to crawl in that crevice, it will always be compared to this game. When Koji Garashi was leaving Konami in the year of the MTV Movie Awards winner in the category hashtag WTF? whatever that means, Neighbors 2014 to pursue a fresh Kickstarter start with Bloodstained. He looked back on their 3D Castlevania in an interview with Kotaku and said, We made two 3D Castlevania games and to be honest, they didn't turn out so well. Since the quality of our 3D Castlevania games wasn't that high, it wasn't really our place to tell the developers of Lords of Shadow how to do one. They had that expertise. In that regard, Dave Cox at Lost of Shadow developer Mercury Steam put it like that. We needed to make a change, so we did. 
the Castlevania series wasn't going anywhere. Sales were dwindling, and it was appealing only to a very small, hardcore fanbase. That's how franchises die. We have to take these risks if Castlevania is to survive. Otherwise, it's just going to be like Mega Man. And where are our buddies potato salad and egg sandwich holding hands again? Have fun during the rest of your trip to the sun! Only ironic that this second reboot of 3D Castlevania also got a less well-received sequel, cementing the curse that does not let the 3D Castlevania series run past two entries. Konami's current disuse of the franchise, outside of letting people produce Netflix shows, 2D collections and... Uh, those NFTs! With it. Also probably did not help to make newer players aware of the Castlevania franchise as a whole and its past 3D entries like Lament of Innocence. And it's not like people nowadays have to rely on a Castlevania series to get their action exploration fix. They have the difficult choice between several hundreds of refined, intricate diamond necklaces that are modern indie metroidvanias. And while you have to do a bit of searching, you can probably also find some hidden gem indie character action games. If you have more time than me, the person will spend several semi-productive months stuck in this digital office. Huh. For all the people who liked this exact combination of Metroidvania, character action and RPG Lament of Innocence represents, I am sorry. But I think there are even more aspects that stake this game's potential for a creepy vampire castle-sized legacy. To put my unordered thoughts out, and to give this video slightly more variety than Lament of Innocence hallways in my experience, let's construct some rhetorical questions. Is it always sad when people's hard work gets forgotten, even if the end result is in my opinion middling? Of course! Was Lament of Innocence sequel buried under the gaming year 2005 that included Resident Evil 4 and God of War? Really likely! Was the bright new video game star, DMC, more present and hyped at the time than even the long established Castlevania franchise, especially after the N64 games? Probably. Is it basically a joke of the universe? But the worst received DMC2 was still able to achieve the mark of financial success fast enough to get a franchise saving third game that completely reversed the series trajectory while Lament of Innocence sequel maybe got forgotten on store shelves? Perhaps? Could Konami still have changed the demonic tides if they just could have summoned enough faith in the direction that Lament of Innocence went to fund another sequel? According to my speculations, maybe? Did the long-lasting legacy of both the first Del May Cry and maybe even something like the Onimusha series just overshadow Lament of Innocence in the long run? I think so. Did it not help that these franchises settled on one basic style of gameplay for their main series entries, while the PlayStation 2 Castlevania games stick out like a sore vampire thumb in the Castlevania series? At least my brain says yes. Did it incidentally help even less that Capcom published the first few pictures of Onimusha 3 in May of Zac Efron's film acting debut year 2003, which PSM printed right above the first announcement info of the then unnamed Lament of Innocence? What a striking betrayal! And yes, did Lament of Innocence, as a final hit with the giant digital Holy Cross, overstep the comfort zone of at least some Castlevania fans? If we trust the combo-fearing people that literally named the gaming show Castlevania, yes? Maybe 3D and Castlevania just go together like vampires and holy water. Or maybe it just wasn't meant to be. There are always things that don't start something, don't have that much character, or are that unique, or get recognized in the long run for these exact qualities. And even things that are not perfectly made like an expensive clockwork can still find a larger following if they just tick some of these boxes. Perceptions of what is for an individual mediocre of course varies from person to person. And probably all mediocre things are made up of positive and negative qualities. Therefore, one person's mediocre art is maybe another person's personal hidden gem. 
But there has to be some kind of unremarkable in a person's understanding, because nothing shines without mediocrity and without the knowledge gained from the unremarkable, may it be consuming or even unintentionally producing it. You can't really learn from its shortcomings and make your own unique art. Wait, is Castlevania Lament of Innocence the sad office clone of the character action genre? Am I Castlevania Lament of Innocence? Am I nothing half and nothing whole? <laughs> Numerical scores for art are nonsense anyway! Actually, Castlevania Lament of Innocence is totally unique and... Hey! If you have a bit of spare time, could you please help us nail this big No Castlevania Lament of Innocence reviews before and after New Year's banner to the wall? That would be really nice of you! Huh.